Hello, everyone. I'm here with John Paul Aguiar, and John Paul is a blogger and entrepreneur and has dedicated himself to helping other bloggers, entrepreneurs, and small business owners learn how to use blogging and social media smarter. His road to success smart started when he was 25 and needed a kidney transplant and was told he would be put on disability. So he was forced to look for other ways to make money that it wasn't a 9 to 5 job, and within 11 months, he was already making enough money that he was able to stop receiving his disability checks. John Paul took that success and has used his marketing know-how to build a very popular and successful blog with a total following of over 110,000 in less than two years. And in 2013, he was number six on Forbes magazine list of top 50 social media influencers. His approach to blogging and marketing is straightforward and simple no matter how, no matter what your experience. John Paul brings a personal approach to the tips and advice he shares with a touch of humor to make learning less stressful. And today, we are going to talk about why a business needs a blog and how to set it up correctly. And uh, looking at John's credentials here, it looks like he is the perfect person to talk to about this. John Paul, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Doing excellent. I know, uh, you know, blogging is a super important um, component of pretty much every business these days. Not everybody has 100% caught on. A lot of people have, but there's still lots of questions on how to do everything correctly, and I think that's why we all listen to experts like yourself to dig in. So very excited to uh, to pick your brain here and, and, um, and bring out some good stuff. So just want to kind of dig in right away. Uh, first off, just just quickly just touch on exactly what a blog is and how it's different than, you know, blogging on other outside platforms. Yeah, a blog is basically a platform that you own where you create content, whether that's a blog post, uh, a video post, or whatever it is, it's part of your website, it, you own it, nobody else owns it, so, you know, nobody can close it down, nobody can tell you kind of what you can and can't share. and. And it's the best way and the best place to create content around your business that you can then, you know, share outside, share it on social media, share it through your email list, where then those people come back to your blog. And the goal of everything you do online, the way I build my, my business is the blog is my main place. No matter what I go do, whether I'm on Twitter or Facebook, doesn't matter where I go, the goal is to get those people back to my blog because mm-hmm. the longer they stay on my blog, the more they're going to learn about me, the more they're going to possibly uh, get on my email list and buy something from me. So the goal is to always bring people back to your blog. And, and that's the benefit of having a blog that you own on your – that's your platform on your website because then that's how you do it. Then you, you share content, you create content, share it out there, and then get those people to come back to your blog over and over again. Um, and that's the beauty of a blog is a blog is, you know, a soft sell. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's you saying how great I am without saying how great I am. You know, it's like me yep. telling you how great I am just by creating great content. I'm already saying that, but I don't physically have to tell you, hey, I'm so great, you need to come to listen to me. Creating content on a blog, such as blog posts, you're doing that in a way where people already get that without mm-hmm. you having to say how great you are. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest hey. benefit of having a blog. Yeah, and the distinction you made there is it's your your site on your site. You own that platform because there's so many uh, so many things that happen out of your control. You know, Facebook could change an algorithm, or or Vine could get shut down. Well, <laughs> like it's just, just say, yeah, example yeah. Vine. Like you know, many people I know that have ten thousand, twenty thousand Vines they created oh. for what? It is gone. Oh. It is completely gone. And that's yeah. not saying you shouldn't have used Vine, right? It's, no. But the goal should have been to most of those people, most likely, their goal was not to create a Vine and then send them back to their blog. Their goal was to create a Vine, get a little attention on Twitter, and that's it. Mm-hmm. If you did that, then you just wasted all of that time yeah. creating Vines that had no place. You weren't sending people anywhere, for example, to a blog, to benefit outside of Vine. The people who just kept that content on Vine, now what? You have 10, 15,000 Vines that are, got, that are gone and doing nothing for you. So all that content you created is gone and you can't even recreate it. You can't even take it and use it for other things. It's gone. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, like you said, the biggest thing is you don't control these platforms. Same mm-hmm. with Facebook. Facebook, your algorithm changes like weekly. One mm-hmm. week you're doing great, the next week you're not getting attention again. Then you're doing great. It's, it, and there's nothing wrong with that. You want to be on those platforms, but your goal is still to always bring it back home to your blog mm-hmm. because that's what you control 100%. Gotcha. It, it's better to own than rent. You have much more control. 
much more control. Awesome. So what are some other benefits one can expect? Obviously, the the whole natural thing behind blogging, content marketing, the whole thing is to what you basically just mentioned. You're basically telling people how great you are, but you're doing it in a way where you're helping educate them and you kind of have that fuzzy psychologicalness come into play where you automatically get associated as being awesome or cool or helpful or good at what your your service or product is based on just you helping them out. So we have that going for us. What, what are some other benefits one can expect by um, getting going with the blog and why they should decide to use, you know, see this as a good use of their time, energy, and or money? When you create a blog post, especially if you have a business and you're blogging for that business, whether you have a, a products you sell or services you sell, a blog post should be looked at as a, as a soft sell sales page. Every blog post you write that now goes out there, and for example, it gets ranked on Google. That will be ranked, say it gets ranked on the top three on Google. That will be ranked there, let's say, for six months. So now that piece of content will be working for you for six months. Mm -hmm. If you treat each blog post like a, a soft sell sales page, like you said, share your expertise, share how uh, to fix a problem that your product fixes or your service fixes or, or helps people with, talk about that in blog posts. But you don't have to say that my product fixes that. You can just talk around your product and people will get it. And if they read that and they read how your blog posts are helping them fix a problem, they're going to put two and two together. They're going to connect the advice you gave them with, oh, his product will help that also. So without physically saying that or being straight, you know, time selling in your face where you say, to fix this, this, and this, use my product. You don't have to do that. With a blog post, you soft sell. You share information. You teach people. Whether you're teaching people to work with your, use your service and product directly or indirectly, but you by helping people, when that person, if your product is, I don't know, social media management tool or whatever, when that person at some point wants to buy a social media management tool, if they've been reading your blog post for the last two or three months about uh, all around social media management, whether it's tips, advice, tutorials, and even other tools to use besides your own, when they're ready to buy that product, most likely they're going to buy yours because they've read your great content, they've, they like the advice you give, they like that you're not so much in their face, so they'll, you're always in front of them, you continue to create blog posts, you're always in front of that person, so you're always at the forefront, so when they think of social media management tools, social media management tools, you're one of the top ones they think about, and if your content's been helpful for the last so many months and all those things, they'll buy your product, even though you never said, buy my product, I'm better than X, Y, Z, or whatever. They'll mm -hmm. buy it just because you've been helpful. And that's what a blog post can do for you that no other piece of content can do. Because every other piece of content kind of comes off salesy. A blog post can be written in a way where there's no sales, but yet psychologically the person thinks, wow, well, they're really helpful, they're really smart, they're great advice. If mm -hmm. they're giving all this great advice for free and they're helpful, wow, their product must be pretty good. I'm going to check out their product or service. That's mm -hmm. what a blog post can do for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a, it's it's just really a beautiful way to market yourself. You know, it, it feels right. It you feel like you're doing something nice, but then you uh, you get the residual benefit of uh, sales and and uh, that's just. It's the winning formula. Now, what about like choosing a URL? Like, say, say somebody's just getting going. So, okay, I need a blog. But then sometimes you see people. In my opinion, uh, I don't want to tell you what I think is a mistake or not. But I, I see sometimes people do uh, blog.johnpaul.com versus a johnpaul.com backslash blog. Can, can you talk a little bit about that and, and point people in the red, best direction if they're just getting going right now? Yeah, so if you already have a website, right, and you already have a website that you have a domain and you have a website for your business and you would like to add a blog to that, the beauty is if you have a newer theme, if you use, a, a, let's say, a WordPress theme, if that you're on WordPress, then they already have the, the ability to add a blog. The best way to add a blog is to add it as a subfolder, which means it would be jobcallagger.com forward slash blog. The benefit of that is it's technically looked at as just another page, kind of. It's a subfolder on your main URL, but it's looked at like another page on your on your website. So everything you do for that blog will benefit the home URL and vice versa. Everything you do, whether it's promotion, branding, backlinking, you do to the home page URL will benefit the blog. They work together. So if your website, say, has been here for 10 years, you can have huge authority. Adding a blog in this way by doing it with the as a subfolder, which is a you know forward slash blog instead of the blog dot John Paul Aguilar, which is technically a subdomain, which means it's a step entity, a separate uh, platform almost. That's the wrong way to do it. You want to add the subfolder, the forward slash blog, because 
it, like I said, if your site's been around for 10 years, you have huge authority, and now you decide I want to put a blog, that authority you built for 10 years will automatically bypass and go right to your blog. So when you write content on that blog, you will get content ranked better and faster because mm -hmm. technically the blog is almost kind of, like, again, like kind of looked at as just another page on the main URL. So that's the benefit. So when you're writing content, you're trying to get that content ranked for specific keywords around your, your main business URL, that, that content's going to rank a lot faster because you're connecting it to a site that's been authority. If you did it separately the other way, which is blog.johnpaulagia, then it's technically Google will see it as a separate domain, right? Mm -hmm. It's not combined. It's not really part of the John Paul Agia, so that blog will kind of start at zero, right? And then whatever you do on that blog doesn't really benefit the main URL and vice versa. Gotcha. So if I had a choice, 100% do the subfolder, which would be the dash blog, um, because there's no really no negative to doing it that way because all, it's basically you're doing all the work for one and you're actually building two separate, even though the blog is not its own website, but you know what I mean? You're, you're building two yeah. platforms for the same amount of work. If you did it the other way, you would have to do backlinking promotion and branding for the home URL and you'd also have to do backlinking branding for the uh, blog URL. So you're doing mm -hmm. it's almost like having two websites. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. I would definitely gotcha. choose the subfolder. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we are in agreement there. <laughs> I didn't want to didn't want to debate you, but and I was, but I also wanted to hear your true thoughts on it. Yeah. So basically, you know, a, a good analogy is to think that the rising tide helps all the ships in the harbor. And, and if you have the blog tied to your site, all the benefits that you're getting for the blog is going to raise your entire site. If you do it the reverse way, you're like, okay, yeah, I heard this guy said all these good things. We got to do a blog, and then you go in, and then you get a separate blog site, blog dot something. That that is such the wrong way to do it. And and John Paul, let me just say, you know, I've talked to somebody else about this, another expert about this recently, and 100, 1 million percent agree with exactly what you with what you're saying. So everybody understand just and, and even if you're not on a WordPress site, I believe you can still get you know you can still connect to WordPress. You still have support, yeah. If you have even worse, what even I would just recommend don't do is I see people where they have a website for the business and they've been around for a while and they want to add a blog and they go the really easy, cheap way and go to like WordPress.com and get and set up a free blog and yeah. then just put a URL on their main site that sends them to a completely platform that they don't even own, don't do that. You don't. Just, cause that you don't own that and you're basically taking the traffic and attention away from your site and sending it to your blog that is you know, on a free platform, whether it's WordPress.com or any other of these free services. That's even worse. So mm -hmm. I see a lot of people doing that because they want to add a blog. They don't know how. They, this is an easy way to do it. And they think, oh, no big deal. I'll just get a WordPress.com blog set up there. I'll connect it with just one link on my you know, navigation bar where it says, hey, go read my blog where you're basically now taking them from your website to somebody mm -hmm. else's website. That's yeah. even worse. So don't do yeah. that. Gotcha. <laughs> if you had a choice, then you know, the blog dot jump all is better than that option because I yeah. do see a lot of people doing that because they don't want to deal with the technical side and they think, oh, is no big deal. They don't understand the SEO benefits and the branding benef benefits by having it all in one place. So they're like, oh, let me mm -hmm. set up a free site, and that's, that's even worse. So gotcha. don't do that. Yeah, everybody, everybody who's just getting going, go back listen to this last two, three minutes. It, it's very important. Just do it the right way, johnpogiar.com backslash blog. Do that, and, and it's not that technical to get this done right. You can probably – Get somebody to help you, but make it part of your paid part of your site. And um, even if you're not on WordPress and you, you like their themes, you can totally connect it. It's not that that hard. Uh, even if you don't know how to do it, there's other people who can easily help you. So make sure you do that. If not, most of your efforts are going to be going to waste. All right, let's move on to uh, on-page elements. Uh, I would like for you to dig into some key. Uh, assuming okay, you set it up right, right? On, that's obviously very important to set it up, you know, get, get the domain correct. Right. So you get that done. So now other on-page elements within that particular blog page. What I uh, would like for you to dig into some key on-page elements that are necessary to, to have to make sure that everything is 100% optimized and set up correctly. Can you give a, a few key pointers there? Yeah, once you do that, once you have the blog set up, you know, the branding will match, the look and feel will match, the, you know, the themes, all that set up, the design-wise should be done because it will move from the main uh, website to the blog. So that's done. But the elements, depending on your goals with a, the with a blog, is you want to focus on above the fold. And above the fold means when you get to a website, what you see from the bottom of your screen to the top, without doing any scrolling, that is above the fold. That is the most important part of a website. So you want to hit people with the most important parts of you, what you want, your plan with your blog, whether it's an email list, whether it's um, promote, showing a picture of yourself with a bio to make it more personal, 
to me, I would have an opt-in box at the very top because you have to build email from day one. I don't care if you start your blog today, you start it. doesn't matter. Stop building your email list from day one. Have an opt-in box. Give something away. I don't care what it is. Something tied to what your business or service is. Give away something free, whether it be an e-book, a white paper, a small little five video, video, video series, whatever it is that's helpful but targeted 100% to what you're doing on your main website, get people's emails. So that should be right above the fold. That should be in a header. I would put it at the top. On the side, I would make it personal. If you are a one-man show and you own your business and you want to put your face to it, put your face on the blog and make it personal. People like that. They want to know who's writing the blog, who's writing the content. Put a bio, put a picture, put a quick little three or four lines of who you are, what the blog is about. Send them, link them back to your About Me page if they want to read the full bio. But make it personal. That's number one thing. Text-wise, I would go to bigger font. I like using a bigger font on my blog. It makes it easier for people to read. So I like to do about a 14 or 15 point um, simple. I like a nice simple aerial font, nothing fancy. It makes it easy to read on small screens. And the easier you can make things for people to read and to share, the, the better. Because you don't want them to have to work too hard. You know how many times I go to share somebody's blog posts and their share buttons are a mess? They don't work. And it takes you five minutes just to take the content, put it together, because I want to share it on Twitter for you. When you make it that much work, what's going to happen is they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So you want to make things very simple, simple to opt in, simple to comment, simple to share. If you want a share button, um, I like mine on the side, on the left side, and at the bottom of the blog post. Don't put them at the top of the blog post because that makes no damn sense. Because the person hasn't read the blog post yet, so why would they share the content if they haven't even read it yet? So putting share buttons at the very top under the title makes absolutely no sense. Because mm -hmm. once they scroll, that's gone. They don't see that. So it doesn't yeah. help you in any way. And that yeah. hurts your SEO. So. Sidebar, I like it on the left. It scrolls with your blog post, great. And at the bottom of the blog post, when they're done reading it, that's when you want them to do something. That's when they're going to say, wow, I love that post David put together. I'm sharing it. That's when you want to hit them with share buttons, not at the top because it makes no sense. Yeah, and I also heard um, Andy Crestadina uh, is a big on-page guy with Orbit Media Studios, and he calls those the – if you when they're at the top, it's funny you say this. I just read this the other day. Uh, when they're at the top, he calls them candy-coated exit signs <laughs> or something. Yeah, it's, you know, when it's, when they're at the very when they're at the very top. You know, because yeah. you don't. There's no point to them. They're not going to do anything just yet. So, but the, all it does is exit them from your from your um, from your site. And, and you're asking somebody to share something they haven't read yet. So why would exactly. I share? With you? The basically, you're saying, Can you please share my post. If you're mm -hmm. saying that before I even read it, that makes no sense. I've read yeah. it. I don't know if I like it. I don't know if it's any good. I don't know if I'm going to share it. But if mm -hmm. you put it at the end, after the person's read your blog post, obviously, if they like the blog post, that's when you hit them with, hey, don't forget to share it on social media for me. Then they'll do that. They're not going to scroll, and then you want it to scroll. And then if you have it at the top, and I don't know, you have a 1,000-word blog post, even you scroll one scroll, those icons are gone. So by the time I get to the bottom of the blog post, there's no social media buttons. I'm going to have to scroll all the way to the back of the top of the blog post and click those buttons. Again, making it harder for people to do things to help you is not smart. You want to make things very simple. You want the mm -hmm. site to be laid out simple. You want to share what's most important. What's important to you? If it's important to you to build an email list, then that should be front and center when people land on your blog because that's your call to action. That's your main goal. If it's to build your brand, then you want your logo. You want your image of you, all, all that branding that matches your social media branding with Twitter, header, Facebook, all that stuff. You want it to all be on the blog. So mm -hmm. that's what you want to do. On the sidebar, if you have a service or a product, I would do the bio with an image. I would also have uh, related blog posts because, again, you want to try and keep them on your blog as long as you can. So if they read one piece, you try and get them to read another piece. The longer they're there, the better chance you have of getting them to buy something or to get on your email list or even to share something on social media. So I would do that, and I would have one banner, one banner about your service, very simple. That way, as they read the blog posts, they see the banner, and they can go learn more about what's on the home page, whether it's a product or service or whatever your business is about. That way it's there, but it's not like in your face. It's not, the blog is not about pushing the product and service, but it's there if they want it. It's really about you sharing content cleanly, uh, have a layout. I like to do the a big image, a little bit of text, so they know what each blog post is about before they read it, uh, and keep it clean. And try to keep about 10, 15 blog posts per on your blog on the on the list. That way, it's not overwhelming. And that way, there's content, there's opt-in box, there's personality, there's you know the image of you and your bio, 
And that's really what you want people to see when they get to your blog. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the floating left icon for the Twitter. What, what's your favorite plugin that you've used for that? Your f favorite share icon plugin? For uh, that? Right now, I use Dig Dig. I've been using Dig Dig for a while. Um, you spell that? That way, Dig Dig gives you ability to float it on the left. Mm -hmm. And also, there's a Buffer team. Buffer bought Dig Dig. So if you search, well, it's a WordPress plugin. Buffer okay. owns Dig Dig. But if you type in Dig Dig, you'll okay. see it. And that gives you the ability to manually place buttons, add them at the bottom and float them on the left side like I do. And then it gives you the ability to customize the padding. So you want the buttons to be close to the text on the left side aligned to the content, but you don't want to be right on top of the text where it makes it half for people to read. And they give you the ability to float that so it pushes it out a little bit. You can customize it to make it look really nice and fit your website nicely. Um, but uh, Social Warfare, I think it's called, they do really nice buttons. Problem with they did great service, but their buttons are all the old school buttons. Um, but if you want something more modern, clean look, uh, Social Warfare does really nice buttons. Uh, okay. And they have the Twitter account because I know how you know how some services have lost the oh, Twitter account. That's nice. Yeah, Social Bu Yeah, they they uh, they have a, a Twitter account. So when you get tweets, it'll show the number. So it huh. does does that too. But there's a service I've got the name of it. But you can sign up for a service and it shows the Twitter numbers. But they're not perfect like they used to be. But Social Warfare does that, so you can still have your Twitter numbers show. That's a good for tool. Digress for two seconds here. Why the heck did Twitter do that? I don't know. I, I don't understand half the stuff they've done the last <laughs> six that, to twelve just, months. It I, makes I, no I, sense. I, like I, I don't get the it. People that built, yeah, the people that built your platform. Like I spent, yeah. let's say, I spent eight years kicking my ass trying to get my blog post to get shit on Twitter. Right? Yeah. That those numbers on my Twitter account, it, they mean something. When people yeah. come, especially for me, since I teach people how to use Twitter, so if they yeah. come to my blog post and I have three tweets. That's yeah. embarrassing because I'm, I'm telling you I can teach you Twitter yeah. and you see tw three tweets and you're going to laugh and be like, John knows nothing. But if they see 300 tweets, yeah, it's yeah. impressive. So why would you hurt the people who have worked so hard the last eight years to build your platform and make no the, and they're not one of the biggest, one of the biggest blunders I've seen a big company make. I, I, I just don't. And now they're hurting. So hmm, there you go. You know, it's weird. But anyways, that was a small digression. That was just – <laughs> just irritating. Now, what, what about um, just some back-end stuff real quick on the blog, the, you know, the title tag, the meta description, that stuff. Can you, can you just dig into that real quick um, as far as on-page, other on-page things to consider? Yeah. So if you're writing, if you have a blog set up, uh, you want a title tag. Your title tag is basically tells Google or any search platform uh, what your blog's about. So, for example, mine is make money blogging. My keyword is uh, blog marketing and make money blogging. So those are my main two keywords for my blog. So for my title tag, it'll say make money blogging, blog marketing advice, or whatever it is. So that way my goal is to get my website to rank for blog marketing and also make money blogging. So that's, you want a nice title tag, so you have to, when you set up the blog, you want to do this in the beginning. Think about, you know, basically the people you want to read your website, and then find keywords that fit that. And I, I like to do, when I do a title tag, I do two. One home run keyword, and then one lower keyword. Meaning the home run keyword would let's say it would be like a ten thousand volume, Google volume, and then the regular keyword would maybe be like two or three thousand. So I can rank for the smaller one slow you know, quickly and then the long, the bigger one will take me a little time, but that's okay, because if it takes me a year or whatever, two years to rank for a ten thousand volume keyword, that's huge. So uh -huh. if you want to use that in your title tag, you also want to use those keywords throughout your content. So if you have images on your home page, um, for me I have a title where, you know, teaching you how to be a social blogging entrepreneur, so I have some words in that. And use your keyword in those images on your home page. Mm -hmm. And then and if what, you're doing an actual – go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. And the description is the same thing, that you're basically taking the title you made and then building off of that and then making your, your meta keyword for the home page just a little more in-depth. So you want to add the same keywords and put a little more detail in it. And then you want to be – understand, people are going to read that. So when they go on Google and they see my blog and your blog, we're both blog marketing blogs and – your title tag has my keyword and I have yours, but in my description, I have a better description than you. Chances are they're going to click on my website over yours because the little mm -hmm. snippet that Google shows you, if I write it better or more attractive, then they're going to click on my site over your site. So mm -hmm. if you want to pay attention to your, your description, and that works applies to the home page, to pages on your website, and also to mm -hmm. blog posts. The better mm -hmm. that description is, that little snippet that Google is going to show, the more attractive it is, the faster somebody's going to click on that over the other, you know, if you're number five on page one, for example, and it's, you know, four, three and four and seven and eight around you, if you want to stand out from those people, even though you're not in the top three, 
your description will do that. A great description will get people's attention. Gotcha. And that's the meta tag or meta description. Yeah. And just to clarify, when you when you're on Google, when you ever search something, it's like that two to three line sentence underneath it. Yeah. So John Paul's saying, hey, this blog is about X, Y, Z, and just write something compelling in the amount of space that you have. So you might need to work on it a little bit. But basically, just tell people what it's about and um, and that's the human aspect of it. Yeah, that's put your the human uh, keywords to the front. Yeah, put your keywords to the front of that description. The closer to the front, the better for SEO. You want to be mm -hmm. within the first five words, and mm -hmm. then be descriptive. And you have about 160 characters that Google shows. And mm -hmm. same with your title tag, whether it's for the home page, a blog post. You want your keyword for, for example, if you're doing a blog post, then you want that keyword as close to the front of that title as possible, because mm -hmm. it's at the end of the title. Uh, somebody that has the exact same setup, the exact same blog post, has to get up exactly the same way. But if their title tag, their keyword in that blog post is at the front and yours is at the back, they'll outrank you even though everything else is 100% the same because uh -huh. that title keyword is to the front. So try to get it to the front. Sometimes it's a little hard to get to do that because some keywords it's hard to, to put them in the front of a sentence, but that's what you want to do. So whether it's a blog post, your homepage, title tags, and uh, description, put the keywords to the front. Be descriptive on a blog post. Tell people why they should read. Basically, why should I read your blog post? If you're gotcha. doing five tips and say, you know, here's five tips on why you should, you know, think about SEO when you write a blog post. But be descriptive because you want to get people's attention. So even if you're not, if you're in the top three of a Google keyword, you're going to get attention regardless. But if you're not, then the other way to get attention is having a great title, descriptive, creative, attention grabbing. They call it link based. And then your description should be just as good. And forces me to want to read yours your posts over the three or four that are around you on page one. Gotcha. Now, what what are, I mean, I guess to not doing some of the things you suggested might be the answer to this, but just out of curiosity, what are some of the most on, the most common on-page blunders you see people make? Now, I think they, it, with a website, and I did this in the beginning too, is I think when people start a blog, I think they, too much is, they think if this is good, if five is good, ten will be better. And it's not the case. You want to keep it about the content. Like that one banner on the side, I see a lot of people putting way too many banners all over the place, whether it's Google uh, AdWord banner or Google banners or, you know, banners of affiliate products. Or You want to keep the noise to a minimum. You want people to focus on your content and your email opt-in. That's it because that's what you're trying to get people, especially if you're using the blog as part of your, your main website. And your goal is to get them to read your content because, again, those little pieces, those blog posts are mini soft sell stage, sales pages. So they're going to do more for you than having a banner in somebody's face because that if you write your blog post correctly, those are sales pages. So you focus on that. Make sure you get email. I know a lot of businesses don't grab emails from the beginning, and that's a huge mistake because I don't care how big you think social media is. Email marketing is probably the biggest thing that will run your business today, tomorrow, five years from now. Email is not going anywhere. So you need to build your email list, and I see a lot of people that don't do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the branding, like, make sure it looks nice, man. It's sad to say, but if your site looks like shit, people are going to leave. I don't care how great your content is. If it's mm -hmm. designed shitty, the colors are horrible, it just, it's not well laid out. People are not even going to read the content. And your content may be amazing, but it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. And this is the world we live in. It's got to look good. You see that every day. I see crap products being sold for thousands of dollars with this ugliest sales page, but yet, they still sell it. You can't have an ugly site. You have a beautiful sales page or a beautiful blog, cleanly laid out. And it doesn't have to be like amazing colors and super design. Just simple. Keep it clean. Match your branding colors to your website and focus on content first. Make sure when somebody lands on your site, I see blog posts and, uh, you know, opt-in boxes. That's your main goal. But content, you want it to be simple and clean. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, we, we touched on this a little bit, but just to clarify, you do see people get this wrong as far as the um – the content that they're pushing out, and, uh, and uh, um, just dig into that. You know, what, what, should companies be writing about themselves at all? You know, a lot of times, you know, when, when blogs first started, uh, it was a way to basically put out a press release or to make an announcement and do stuff like that. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. the trend has turned to being helpful and educational. I'm not talking about yourself, but just clarify: should you should you ever? put something and talk about yourself or your product or services uh, on your blog, or, or should it pretty much 99.9% .9 of the time or 100% of the time be um, helpful information? No, I think a mix is the best. I think, because, again, at the end of the day, it's still a blog about your business. So we're not trying to hide that. We're not trying to 
have a blog be a separate entity and it's not part of your business. The goal is you're using the blog to promote the business. So people are going to know that. It's just you don't want every blog post to be about your product. So you want news updates. You want a mix. You want content that's helpful. You want to share um, updates, you know, business updates, company updates. If you have a new product coming out, you want to talk about that. If you have an update to a product, you can even do blog posts about your product and how other people are using it to fix a problem. So if your problem fixes one and two, share how other people are using your product to fix one and two. So you're not really talking about your product. You're kind of talking about fixing the problem, and you're just showing how John is using my pro our product to fix that problem. You're not saying, hey, we're the only solution. We're just saying this is how John is using our product to fix it. Or give ideas on, because sometimes you have a product or a service, and people don't really see the benefit fully of how they can use it. They maybe see, well, I can use it one or two ways, but they don't see the other six ways that they can use your product or service. Do blog posts to share that. Give people ideas on how they can reuse your product. So if they do buy it, they're getting the most from that product that they can instead of, oh, I'm going to buy it for whatever, 100 bucks, and I can only use it. I only know that I can use it for this one thing. But in reality, I could be using it for six other things. Now that makes my $100 feel pretty good because I'm using it for so many other things. So you can do blog posts about that. So I think it is a mix. Company updates, have some fun with it. If you guys go on a company retreat or something, share that. Share some personal. Share, make sure that people know you're a real company, you're real people. Share that. If you do an event, record that event. Take pictures, whatever. Have, you know, if you have employees, if you have more than one employee, have them share content. If you guys don't know that, again, take images. Do a blog post, some personal. So I think you need a mix of everything because you need the personal to show that you're a real normal company, approachable, trusting, because if people see you having fun with your work and, and you as the owner of the company, I, I think that automatically makes you more trusting because you just seem like a normal guy. Do sure. that. Do content that just, you know, company updates, product updates, new services. Do some uh, – highlight some of your customers. Like I said, highlight a customer. How is how John using my our product to fix this and this? And then still do the, you know, the helpful content. I think you need a mix of everything. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, when you say everything, you know, you, a lot of times, you know, on social platforms, the – you know, standard strategy is to not just share your own stuff, but, you know, do aggregate posts, like on your Facebook page, Twitter feed, and all that stuff. Should any of that go on your blog, any any other people's content? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't do a lot of other people's stuff. Um, there's nothing wrong, like, for example, doing um, – I use infographs other people make a lot. It's – other another company wrote, made up infograph about, I don't know, uh, blogging mistakes. I'll use it on my blog because it still applies. Even though I didn't make the product, I'll add my own tips to go with the infograph. Uh, that's what I recommend is if you take somebody else's product, I mean, uh, content like an infograph, add your two cents and share that person. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as it's not your direct competition, don't do that. But you can share an infograph that deals with a, pro a problem or, or some or a tip that is closely tied to what your product or business is about. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Doing Even doing a, a list post. I know those are huge right now, and I mm -hmm. used them back in the day, but they, they're huge right now where – Take a few people that whatever your, you know, target or topic your business deals with, find experts, other experts in that field, and do a, a combined post. Get 10 people. What's your, you know, 10 mistakes you shouldn't make or whatever that's tied to what you do, and get advice from those people. Do content like that. That's, that's as close as I do to taking other people's content is doing that. Like a list post of experts work really well, and then you get those experts to share that content. So that content usually gets a lot of traction for you because now each of those people would then share it. I wouldn't go gotcha. past 20 people. You see lists of like 200 people, which is insane. Who has time to read 200 comments? 200 advice from 200 people on one blog post. So keep it like 10 to 20 people, and it's fine with that. Again, it's all moderation. You want most of the stuff to be coming from you, whether it's personal, whether it's business highlights, whether it's new product announcements, whether it's content that you're creating to help your, your customers or readers. But there's nothing wrong with once in a while throwing in uh, a little bit of somebody else's stuff. Again, as long as it's not your direct competition, uh, that's fine. But, yeah, but to clarify, you don't mean like somebody else's post and you just post it there. You, you, you've you mentioned some strategic ones, but not somebody else's post. You just put it up there, correct? You're talking about you no, use an infographic no, but you, and you collaborate and stuff like that, but you're not talking exactly. about – like on Facebook and Twitter, you might share somebody else's post, period, you know, without you being a part of it, but – yeah, you're not saying to post that stuff, though, just to clarify, correct? No, not on your blog. On your gotcha. blog, uh, when you post on social media, you have to share other people's stuff. That's how you build relationships. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. The reality is you have to give to get. But on yeah. your blog, when I take somebody's infograph, I'll take their infograph, I'll link to them, right? So I'm giving them credit. Obviously, the infograph will probably have some graphic on it saying, you know, let's say Salesforce.com created this infograph. 
So you know that's not, I'm not saying it's my infograph. I'll say, hey, this great infograph from Salesforce, I'll give a link to that to credit them. And then I just don't just do that, adding your two cents. So, yes, the post is about, for example, Salesforce is infograph, but you're also adding your two cents. Whether you add in a few tips before, you know, to add in, you still want to add in your two cents. Or this is how I see this infograph. This is how I exactly explain this infograph, or how you can use this infograph to better help you. So adding your your two cents to go with that infograph. So yes, it's not your infograph; it's somebody else's. But you made it your own. You're still giving them credit with a link, so they know that you put it on your blog, which they will love that that you share their content. What people don't want is take that in, you know, if I took that infograph and remove Salesforce's logo from the bottom and then say, hey, here's the infograph I created. You don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that as long as you give credit and then, mm-hmm. like I said, adding your two cents to go with the infograph so you're still making your own a little bit and it's still helpful. Gotcha. Now, the we, we've kind of, uh, kind of moved over a little bit to strategy, strategic, you know, off-page elements a little bit in, in the sense that, um, not necessarily like on page, do this, you know, put this button here, do this. We're talking about like strategy now a little bit. So I'd like to kind of go down that path a little bit further. Can you talk about some other strategic elements that one must consider, you know, to make sure we're going down the right path, be it, you know, the voice or, um, you know, sharing at different times of the day, that kind of stuff. Can, can you talk a little bit about some other good advice once you have everything set up, you know, and we've talked a lot about that right now, so you should have a pretty pretty good idea. You know, obviously this is just one podcast. So you should continue to go and follow people like John Paul or John Paul specifically to continue to learn about all that stuff. But then now you're getting going now. Okay, what are some other strategy elements to consider? So can you talk a little bit of, uh, you know, what, what advice you can give there? Yeah, I think, you know, as you, if you have a blog, you know, when you create the blog, you really have to have a plan of why you have the blog. Because having a blog and not having a plan, you'll never use it. And you won't use it to the full potential if you don't really know why you're using it. So mm-hmm. I think the number one thing is know why you're using it. If your goal is to share content or share advice on how your product or service can be used, then, then do that. But you know the people you're going to write for. So, you know, you know your customers already, so know who you're going to write for. And, and write it. Uh, there's really no way to write the content. I think you just write it the way you write it because then people will, will read that and they'll like the way you write. People will either love the way you write, they'll love your content, or they'll hate it. So you really need to have a plan and just write it. Try not to be uh, – try to bring some personality to it, whether you have a business or not. Try to have some personality and write in a way that other people don't write because my biggest success, success has been writing differently. Not that I'm sharing mind-blowing advice, but it's, I'm sharing it in a different way or maybe easier for people to understand, maybe with some comedy, whatever it is. So I have personality into my blog post. So I try to bring personality in. Try to do that. <clears throat> you want to share your content. The problem is having a blog is you need to understand is nowadays to have a successful blog, the writing of the content is the easy part. It's the promotion that's more important than the content because you can write the best piece of content, the nicest blog post that super helpful and explains your product, everything is 100%. But if you do no promotion, nobody will read it. It won't matter. I would rather you write a good blog post, not a masterpiece, but then learn how to promote it correctly because you'll get more from that. More people will read it. More people will share it. That will bring in more leads, more possibly more customers. So know that when you write the blog post, that's just the first easy step. Learn how to promote it on social media. I share it on Twitter, Facebook. Throughout the day, I share my content about three times. If I do a new blog post, I share it three to four times that day, about four to five hours separated. Because not everybody's on Twitter at nine in the morning. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's on Twitter at, at you know lunchtime. And a lot of people are on Twitter and on social media after ten o'clock because the kids are away, kids are to bed, they're they're relaxing after work at dinner, the kids are away. A lot of people are on social media at night. So learn to share your content throughout the day and watch when it does well. If you notice that, wow, every time I share my blog post at 4 o'clock, then make sure you share your blog post at 4 o'clock or very close to that every day because you would notice that every time you share it at 4 o'clock, it gets a lot of traction, then do that. You know, you want to you want to look at metrics. See, for me, I'm not a big uh, analytics guy because I think the problem is you get caught up on the analytics and then it kind of hurts you producing more content. So you want to kind of look at your analytics, look at the metrics and say, hey, is my blog post getting better? Uh, each blog post I do, are they getting more shares? Are we getting more opt-ins? Do I notice every time I do a blog post, my opt-ins go up? If no, then something's wrong. Either your content's not connecting with people or you're sharing it incorrectly. If it's going up, keep doing what you're doing because 
you know it's working. You're getting more people coming to the site. You're getting more social shares. You're getting more opt-ins each time you do a blog post. I wouldn't get crazy with analytics because, like I said, then you get caught up with that in the beginning, and you really just want to share content, create content, and not get too caught up with the numbers. So there's certain things you should look at to make sure that you're on pace and you're doing things and things are going up and the blog is working for you. Um, and like I said, you have to, when you create content, we talked about before with the keywords and everything. For me, I don't write any piece of content without a keyword in it because it makes no sense not to. It's harder to write, to write a piece of content or blog post that people love to read and share but also will get ranked in Google. It's hard to do, but if you do it, it takes a little more effort, but you'll benefit because you can get a blog post that's ranking for you today and is ranking for you, say, for the next 12 months. If it's on page one, that blog post is, continues to work for you for the next 12 months because you added a keyword, you did the backlinking for it. So for me, if I had a business, I don't write any piece of content without a keyword. It don't matter, but even if it's a very small one, even if it's only 100 volume, I don't care. There's always a keyword in it because I know for only a little bit of extra work, I potentially would benefit for years possibly that that piece of content will rank and bring me traffic day in and day out even though I already forgot about that blog post. This blog post that has bringing me traffic, I remember writing because it was three years ago, yet it still brings me traffic. So that's the main thing is make sure you try and get some keywords into your content. Mm -hmm. Learn, have a goal, know why you have a blog, learn to create the content that people like, a mix of what we talked about before, a little bit of everything, and check your stats, make sure things are going the right way, but don't get too crazy with them because um, it'll, it'll, make, it'll become a negative. If you focus too much on the stats, what happens is people start saying, I'm not getting attention, my blogs are not getting shares. But in reality, if you're not getting shares, you're still driving traffic. So I get put shares when I tweet something. Sometimes I'll get, let's say, two retweets. But in reality, if it's a video, like for a SlideShare, like the other day, I shared it, it got only two retweets. But I got 150 views on SlideShare, 150 people read it, watched it, but I only got two retweets. So if you get too caught up on some of the stats, you start to forget some of the other stuff. Gotcha. You're still benefiting, you're still building your brand. And what are some other strategy execution, I guess, misconceptions people might have? I, I've seen you talk about this as far as, like, blogging, needing to blogging every day, you know, only writing a certain length of post and that stuff. Can, can yeah. you talk – can you clear up some of that stuff as well? Yeah, I think if you're – unless you're – this advice is unless you're a tech blog, right? If you're just a business and you have a blog to go with that business, then two posts a week is more than enough. Even one a post a week if you've been blogging for a while. But I think two posts a week is enough because for me, when I do a blog post, that blog post gets attention for about three days. I get shares the first day. I get a good amount of shares the second day. By the third day, things start to slow down, right? And even the tracking coming in, by it starts to slow down. By the fourth day, it's like the perfect time to hit it with another blog post. That way, your traffic and attention is coming in steadily. So just as one blog post is slowly losing attention, you, you do another blog post. And that will keep you rolling with traffic throughout the week. So two a week is more than enough. If you've been here a while and you've been blogging a while and your blog gets a lot of attention, then you can get away with one blog post a week if time is an issue because of all the work you have to do on the back end to promote a blog. It's not just write a piece, put it out there, and think everybody's going to come. It's mm -hmm. more work on the back end that people don't see. That's what people don't see. When you see, for example, I get a blog post and I have 500 retweets. Yeah, that's great, but what you didn't see is all the work it took me in the back end to get <laughs> people to see that blog post. You know what I mean? Right. To get the 500 retweets. So yeah. two weeks is good, is, and I think most people can handle that. And then long and short, you want to mix. I, I know people say do long content. I, I don't believe long content will outrank short content. I think good content is good content. Whether For me, I say what I have to say and I get out. If it takes me 500 words to, to share something and be helpful, then I do use my 500 words and I get out. If it mm -hmm. takes me 2,000 words to say the same thing and be just as helpful, uh, then I'll use 2,000 words. So for me, I hate reading blog posts that, I learned something, but I could have learned it in three quarters of the content or half of the content. I didn't have to read a thousand words. I could have learned that in 500. So mm -hmm. say what you have to say and get out, whether that's 500 words, whether that's 3,000 words, whatever it is, I think the mix is best. And if you create it correctly, you keyword it correctly, it'll outrank a short piece or outrank a long piece. And you mm -hmm. see that every day. When I'm chasing keywords every day, I see that. I see small little blog posts out beating out, you know, these huge pieces of content because if you write a long piece of content, a long blog post, and you don't SEO it up correctly, you don't add the keywords correctly, then that won't outrank a short content, short post, 500 words or, or 750, um, that's created correctly, keyword rich, and it has keywords in the title and everything's correct, that'll outbeat a long post content. And not everybody has time to read 
3,000 words on your blog. So you want people to come in. Sometimes you need the 3,000 or 2,000 words. That's fine. Sometimes you can do the same thing with five, then do it with five and get out. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to point out to everyone, we're going to do another uh, podcast together here, and we're going to be talking about blog promotion strategies, but um, we're going to be digging into, into that another time because that, that's a podcast all in, a, in, in, a, an, in and of itself. So we'll be uh, digging into that at another time because, um, like I said, there's a lot to talk about there. Um, all right, kind of just to tie up here a little bit, I know we talked about a couple tools that you used for um, your social sharing. Can, can you let us know what else is in your, your deck here, um, your marketing deck, as far as the tools that you, you have seen you work the very best for you and, you know, um, I anything tied to, to the blog as far as um, the, the, the different tools you use? Yeah, for me, number one is uh, I use Hootsuite. I schedule all my blog posts, and for the people who hate scheduling, it's insane. Because if you try to grow a blog and try to manually share content throughout the day that you need to on social media, it, it ain't going to happen. You have mm -hmm. to schedule things. And there's nothing wrong with scheduling. People don't care. Your, your followers or readers don't care where a blog post came from. They don't care if you manually were at the computer sharing it on Twitter or if it came from Hootsie and was scheduled out earlier. They don't give a shit. What they do care is when that piece of content goes out on social media, are you available? Are you just a bot sharing content out and you're not even around to engage with that content. That's what they care about. They don't care that it came from Hootsuite. What they do care is once it goes out and they have a question or they retweet it and you thank them or you, you answer their question in, you know, within five or ten minutes or whatever it is. That's what they care about. So you have to schedule your content. And Hootsuite for me is great. Buffer is another tool. I use Buffer a little bit. But I, Hootsuite, without Hootsuite, I'd probably be lost on sharing content every day. I've been using that for so long. Um, as far as keywords, I like Google, uh, Google Keyword Planner. It's changed a little bit. It's still useful. I also like Word Tracker. Uh, Word Tracker works really well. And if I'm looking for long tail keywords, which I think everybody should, I use Hit, uh, Hit Tail. Hit Tail is a great tool. I've been using that for a few years. And that changes the long tail. And, you know, the difference is a regular keyword may be two words, you know, blog advice, and then a long tail would be blog advice for beginners in 2016. So that's the difference between a long and short. Um, as far as Twitter management and growing my following and finding the right people, I use Audience. It used to be Social Bro uh, a couple of years ago. It's Audience now. Great tool for managing social uh, Twitter and finding the right people and content you want to share too. Um, as far as creating images, I use Canva. Uh, I had no design skills. I can create it in Word and then I give some give it to the designer to make it for me. But with Canva, I look like a pro, man. It's a great tool. It's free. Uh, and then as far as hashtags on Twitter, I like Hashtagify because if you're using Twitter, you really should use hashtags. Um, my recommendation is no more than two per tweet because then it gets messy. But mm -hmm. one to two hashtags, you should use them. There's a benefit. And it's one of those things you don't know it's working, but it's working. You can't, I can't really prove the content where it gets seen more by hashtag. You can't really prove that, but you know it does. So you should use hashtags. And Hashtagify is a great tool for that, finding hashtags you didn't even know were existed. Gotcha. Uh, those are the main tools I use right now, Ben. But I think you covered. You know, I was just going in my head all the different <laughs> things. Yeah, I think I think I think you covered a pretty good range of um, what those things will accomplish for you: scheduling, imagery, finding, you know, the right hashtags, times to post, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, any parting thoughts um, in regards to when people should see a return on the efforts, or anything else you'd like to share before I have to let you go? Yeah, for me, it's, you can't put really time on any of this. A blog is a blog. I can start a blog today and it takes me 12 months to get attention. I can start a blog, you can start a blog tomorrow, and it takes you six months to get attention. And really, I don't put a time on anything. You just need to do it. At the end of the day, having a blog, creating content, and sharing that across social media will help you in so many ways that if you didn't do it, it would never help you. So it's not one of those things I'm going to say, hey, six months of me doing this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. But I guarantee you, if you don't do it, Nothing's going to happen. But if you do do it, you're going to get more email options. You're going to get more leads for your business. You're going to make more sales, and you're going to grow your brand and get connections and build relationships with people that you normally wouldn't do if you didn't have content. And in social media, you need content. And that's why the other thing is you need a blog because if you didn't have a blog, you weren't creating content, where would you get the content that you need to share? So to be on social media and do well, you need to constantly create content. So that's why you need a blog. You need a place to create that content and then share it. So there's really no time limit, but – know that it's something that if you do correctly, if you create helpful content, you share with the right people, and you promote it correctly, 
and you spend the time in social media to, to get attention and you build that email list, all of that will grow your business. No time limit, though. Just do it. Gotcha. <laughs> Trust yeah. me, it'll help you. No, no, that's probably the best way to put it. Um, awesome. Awesome, John Paul. <laughs> well, this was fun. Very educational. Uh, you really covered a lot. Um, I like the way you covered it. I think you're super helpful. Um, and I know people are probably going to want to continue to learn from you. H how can people go about that? Uh, the best way is if they have any questions or whatever. I do. A, I offer a 30-minute free call. We get on Skype. We talk one-on-one. -on -one, answer any questions you have. Uh, that's probably the best thing. If somebody doesn't have a blog, doesn't know what to do, or if somebody will have an idea for a blog but wants to brainstorm, we can do that too. So they can find me that at, at 30, the number 30 with johnpaul.com, and then just sign up for the free call, and then we'll schedule it, and then uh, we'll jump on Skype together. And your Twitter handle? <laughs> uh, at John Agia, J-O-H-N-A-G-U-I-A-R. Awesome. R, a Massachusetts, R. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, let me do it for, for the uh, people in the southern part of the United States. Uh, <laughs> it's A-G-U-I-A-R for that last part. Yeah. There you go. All right. Hey, John Paul, uh, till next time, really appreciate it. And, and uh, like I said, next time we'll, we'll talk about uh, distribution methods and distribution strategy. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.